our prehistory is 100% listener funded, so please consider becoming a patron of the show. For $3 a month, you gain access to exclusive episodes, maps, and timelines. Your support allows our exploration of prehistory to continue. To become a patron, click on the link in the description of this episode, or go to patreon.com slash ourprehistory. Snow stretched to the horizon in every direction. Only scattered grass and distant trees peaked above the white. For three families of foragers, those subtle landmarks were enough to navigate across the wintry steppe. Bundled in thick fur coats, hoods, and soft moccasins, they trudged ahead. The oldest member of the group was an imposing figure, adorned with a thick red bracelet and hundreds of wolf teeth hanging from a woven headdress. Following the footsteps of those in front of her, she was not thrilled to be traveling after the first snow of the season. Her band was laden with dried horse meat and other supplies. This 40-year-old peered into the distance and recognized a patch of birch trees that marked her clan's sacred river, a sight she had not seen since the spring. Guided by those trees, the band eventually reached the familiar center of their winter settlement, with a line of hearths surrounded by pit houses. Inspecting the huts and storage pits, the wizened matriarch was relieved to find their camp undisturbed. She walked to the central fire pit, closed her eyes, extended her arms to the sky, and spoke words of gratitude to the spirits. After this brief ceremony, the younger members of the band went about setting up camp, repairing old huts, and collecting firewood at the river. Taking a seat, the woman watched the action with a keen eye, noticed that many of their mammoth bone shovels had been retrieved from their stash, and made sure that two of the huts were left unoccupied, in anticipation of their kinspeople joining them for the winter. She was surprised when her granddaughter ran up to her and excitedly showed her a gray stone. The woman smiled at the girl when she recognized the wide hips and drooping breasts of a figurine, carved by her own hand. This woman lived about 28,000 years ago and was a well-respected member of a clan of the Kostenki Avdevo culture, occupying a tributary of the Dnieper River in southwestern Russia. Many groups of her tribe lived in settlements across the open steppe and created some of the most fascinating art of the Gravedian. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 15, Gravedian Art. Combined, the Org Nation and Gravedian covered a mind-boggling 17,000 years of European prehistory. That's about 600 generations. Throughout these periods, many aspects of human life remain the same. People primarily hunted large Ice Age herbivores in open landscapes, using antler and bladelet-tipped weapons. Around camp, they wielded stone blades and end scrapers, alongside bone awls and smoothers. But human culture was not static, and trends that began during the Oregonation intensified during the early and middle phases of the Gravedian, including an increase in technological complexity, exemplified by the invention of ceramics and dwelling structures. These trends may have been the result of a larger population, greater continental links between human groups, and more frequent transmission of new ideas. As we will see today, this increasing sophistication of hunter-gatherer society also expressed itself in their symbolic life. 
whereas Aurignacian art was mostly limited to southern Germany and France, during the Gravedian, depictions of animals and humans were produced almost everywhere in Europe where humans lived. This dedication to aesthetic creation has contributed to the perception of the Gravedian as a golden age of hunter-gatherers. In today's episode, we will explore how distinct artistic styles emerged in different regions, how Gravedian art exposes shifts in worldview, and what human burials reveal about Ice Age Europeans. Gravedians decorated themselves with many of the same materials as Oregon nations had. Beads of seashells, animal teeth, and mammoth ivory were the most popular for making jewelry and embellishing their clothing. Fox teeth remain extremely popular ornaments among people in the colder regions of Europe, as did ivory beads, pendants, rings, and diadems. While the materials used to make these decorations were similar to the Aurig nation, Gravedian culture brought with it changes in fashion. For example, on the Italian peninsula, where Aurig nations had rarely used animal teeth, Gravedians frequently adorned themselves with the teeth of red deer, their primary prey species. Also, new ivory bead styles appeared. The basket-shaped beads of the French Aurig nation and the double perforated beads of Swabia were abandoned. Instead, Gravedians in Central and Western Europe shaped ivory into teardrops. These shifts in aesthetic preferences probably spread with the population movements across Europe at the start of the Gravedian. New ornament types were invented in regions with strong tribal identities. For example, the semi-sedentary Pavlovians of Moravia created a stunning diversity of stone, bone, and ivory adornments. One of these was a disc, sometimes with a central hole made from a smooth stone or bone. They shaped and polished these in a time-consuming process, rarely known during the Upper Paleolithic. Pavlovians also carved a variety of ivory pendants, bracelets, rings, and diadems. An interesting motif seen on both rings and pendants was the head of an owl, apparently a significant animal in this culture. Pavlovians also excelled at engraving intricate patterns into ivory. One spectacular tusk, found at one of their settlements, contained inscriptions that appear to represent the landscape surrounding their houses, and has been interpreted as one of the oldest maps in prehistory. A more common pattern, often found on their diadems, is composed of concentric curved lines. This collection of carefully carved and engraved objects blurs the line between ornaments and art. Importantly, Pavlovians were not the only people at the time creating small objects with abstract and representational images. Portable art was made by people in most parts of Europe during the Gravedian, whereas it had been limited to the figurines of Swabia during the Aurignacian. Whether displayed hanging on a string or stashed in pockets or bags, these items were small enough to be carried by foragers as they moved between camps. In contrast, a painting on a rock wall was a type of art rooted in a specific location, and the tradition of cave decoration remained confined to southwestern Europe during this period. It's important to remember that when we discuss prehistoric trends in art, we're limited to images created in media that can survive for thousands of years. Given the technological flexibility of Upper Paleolithic people, they probably decorated organic materials like cloth, animal skin, and wood, which decayed long ago. So as we learn about the art made with stone, ivory, bone, and ceramic, keep in mind that forager life was probably even more colorful and rich than we know. As we explore Gravedian art, a few prominent themes will emerge. Much like the Org Nation, one of these themes found in portable and cave art across Europe is the depiction of large animals. In fact, people in the eastern half of the continent continue to depict a similar assortment of dangerous animals, like lions, rhinoceros, bears, and mammoths. Apparently, the symbolic importance given to threatening creatures persisted in Europe for thousands of years, 
probably in spiritual beliefs or mythologies passed down through the generations. But as we will see today, both figurines and cave art reveal that Ice Age ideology was evolving in other ways. While animals were common subjects of Gravedian art, the appearance of human figures marks a contrast from the Org nation. And interestingly, depictions of women vastly outnumber those of men. Across Europe, forgers were linked by a specific form of female imagery. In Gravedian art, women were most often sculpted in ivory, stone, or ceramic, presented naked, and bore strikingly voluptuous proportions. These are the so-called Venus figurines, perhaps the most famous artifacts of the period, and the subject of great speculation and debate. Upon their discovery, they were named Venus after the Roman goddess of love and fertility because it was believed that they represented a Gravedian deity, which remains an unproven hypothesis. Before we get to the interpretations, let's focus on the facts. More than 70 mostly complete Venus figurines have been found across Europe that date to the Gravedian. To this, we can add more than 100 fragments of incomplete sculptures. They were small, about 10 to 15 centimeters tall. People made these figurines throughout the Gravedian, but there were two major phases of production. First, during the Middle Gravedian, starting around 31,000 years ago, in Western and Central Europe. Ceramic versions were made by the Pavlovians in Moravia, and stone and ivory ones by sculptors in Italy and France. The second phase of Venus production took place during the Late Gravedian, after 29,000 years ago, among people living in the open grasslands of European Russia. Venus figurines were only absent in the more remote regions of Europe, such as Britain and Portugal. Most of the Venus figurines have a recognizable shape, exaggerating the size of the breasts, hips, abdomen, thighs, and vulva. These proportions seem to be a symbolic emphasis of secondary sexual characteristics. In the case of some figurines, medical doctors believe that Gravedians were intentionally depicting obese or pregnant women. Furthermore, the head is usually present but faceless. The size of the lower legs, feet, arms, and hands was minimized. Two of the most emblematic Gravedian figurines that typify this classical form come from Central Europe and are known as the Venus of Willendorf and the Venus of Dolni Vestonice. I'll post images of these and other Gravedian art on Patreon. Although most figures were nude, some wore belts, bra-like garments, and skirts, which appear to be made from woven materials, giving some insight into Gravedian textile fashion. Cross-hatched engravings on the heads of several figurines seems to show headdresses or caps, although they may just represent stylized hair. The corpulent form was the most common, especially in Eastern Europe, but Gravedian people did not restrict themselves to a specific shape. Some Venuses were rather skinny, and some had very detailed faces. In fact, two figurines include only the head. The Venus of Brassempuy from France demonstrates artistic talent in the shaping of a young woman's brows, nose, cheeks, and chin, revealing a placid facial expression. Another, described as the oldest known portrait and made by a Pavlovian artist, contains eyes, a nose, a mouth, and possibly a top-knot hairdo. Other figurines were double Venuses, with two women attached back to back. Although the sculptures are the most famous, Gravedian depictions of women extended into other forms. In the rock art of southern France, at least three caves have portrayals of curvaceous women. An intriguing example is the Venus of Lucel, a bas-relief deeply engraved into a limestone cave wall of a nude woman with wide hips, a rounded belly, and one hand extended holding the horn of a bison. She was painted red and her head is turned towards the horn. 
Other examples of female imagery from the Gravettian include ivory beads shaped like pairs of breasts from one Pavlovian settlement, and carvings of vulvas from Eastern Europe. The prominence of women in Gravettian art brings many questions to mind. For example, what was the symbolic significance of depicting women in the nude, and why were certain body parts emphasized? Also, why did they far outnumber images of men? Over the decades, many theories have been proposed to explain these observations. Early on, Venus figurines were imagined as items of sexual desire created by men, Ice Age erotica, if you will. Others posited that during the Gravettian, a belief in a mother goddess became widespread, which they chose to venerate with figurines. The accentuation of sexual characteristics led to the idea that this was a deity of fertility and figurines were carried by people as good luck charms. Going further into superstition, human and animal figurines may have been used as part of magic rituals. This theory comes from the observation that some ceramic and stone figurines were intentionally broken in Central and Eastern Europe, presumably as some kind of symbolic act. Gravettians may have ritually created and destroyed these images, in the belief that this would bring them good fortune in hunting or childbearing. More modern hypotheses emphasize the possibility that Venus figurines were primarily made by women. Support for this theory comes from the ceramics of the Pavlovian culture, in which 48 fingerprints of people working with the clay were preserved. The width of the furrows in fingerprints can be used to determine the age and sex of a person. These fingerprints reveal that women and children made up the vast majority of ceramic workers. A similar conclusion was drawn from Gravettian handprints in French caves which were also mostly made by women and children. The idea that women may have played a greater role in art production than men prompted the theory that Venus figurines were self-portraits. The exaggeration of the hips, elongation of the breasts, minimization of the legs, and absence of a face may have been the result of a woman viewing her own body, leading to distorted proportions. Alternatively, Women may have produced Venus figurines as practical items, such as toys for children or instructional tools for young women learning about changes in their body. The variation in body forms and frequency of large abdomens may have reflected different stages of the reproductive cycle. Sadly, we will probably never know what these sculptures represented. Whatever their meaning and purpose, the dramatic appearance of Venus figurines probably reflects a change in the significance given by Ice Age societies to womanhood. This discussion of the Venus figurines provides a good opportunity to think about the role of gender in Upper Paleolithic society. For example, to what degree did men and women have equal influence within the small groups in which they lived? And to what extent did men and women perform different roles in everyday forager life? The truth is that we have very little direct evidence to answer this question for the Gravedian and most other periods of prehistory. But one source of information that may provide context are observations of recent hunter-gatherer societies. These studies have shown that compared to farmers, hunter-gatherers are more egalitarian women have more of a say over group decisions, such as over the timing of moves between camps. Also, a woman forager is more likely to stay with her family after marriage than a farming woman, and foragers are more likely to trace their matrilineal descent than farmers. On the other hand, these same studies of recent hunter-gatherers show a strong division of labor between men and women. In general, women are the main collectors of plant food, and men are the primary hunters of large animals. That being said, women frequently hunt small animals and participate in coordinated group hunts. This division in food provisioning is nearly universal in recent forager societies, 
and has large implications for gender dynamics. For example, in more tropical environments where plants make up the majority of food, often up to 70%, women exercise greater control as the main food providers. But the reverse is true in temperate and arctic parts of the world. Providing large amounts of food from hunting brings men prestige and status. We don't know to what degree these observations of modern hunter-gatherers apply to societies from the Upper Paleolithic. The fact that women are the main ceramic workers among Pavlovians is one of the few pieces of evidence for gendered segregation of tasks. Women may have been the main artists of the Gravedian. On the other hand, skeletons of people from the Upper Paleolithic show few differences between men and women. Leg bone strength and asymmetry between right and left arms are very similar in men and women, suggesting similar amounts of physical activity. Also, formal burials of Gravedians don't show major differences in the prestige attributed to men and women. Some archaeologists argue that a gendered division of labor first appeared during the Upper Paleolithic. This is based on the increasing technological complexity, which may have required certain members of forager bands to become craft specialists, such as ivory workers, bladelet nappers, and textile weavers. They argue that gender would have served as a natural way of dividing bands into different artisan groups. Unfortunately, determining whether a woman or a man used a stone tool or made an ivory ornament is impossible, leaving us mostly in the dark on these questions. Some experts have argued that Venus figurines depict women who held a high social status, such as shamans, based on the ceremonial nature of the garments they are shown wearing. Also, their corpulence may have been a hint at a privileged position. A forager with an active, mobile lifestyle was unlikely to reach the levels of obesity depicted in some of the figurines, unless they had preferential access to food and a lower workload. This provocative theory envisions the Gravedian as a female-dominated society, and the Venuses as depictions of their matriarchs. During the Gravedian, people in southwestern Europe entered deep caves to engrave and paint images on their walls, more often than during the Aurignacian. At least 17 sites with rock art in France, Spain, Portugal, and Italy are confidently attributed to the Gravedian. It's important to keep in mind that about 85% of Paleolithic cave art in Europe has not been objectively dated so there are probably more than 17 sites with preserved Gravedian rock art. Objectively dated sites refers to caves where pigment from paintings or mineral deposits that formed on top of paintings have been directly dated with radiometric techniques, like radiocarbon. Or sites where remains of human activity left on the cave floor are only dated to one prehistoric period. The peak phase of cave decoration was the Middle Gravedian, between 31,000 and 29,000 years ago, coinciding with Venus production in Western Europe, and the spread of a regional stone toolkit. People living across a wide area were linked by both technological and artistic customs. Engravings were the primary type of Gravedian rock art, made in soft limestone with a stone tool, or made in the clay that sometimes accumulates on the cave walls by simply running fingers along the surface. But Gravedian artists also employed red and black paint. Their preferred black pigment came from a mineral called manganese oxide. Much like the Aurignacian, the images created were both representational and abstract. In these symbols and figures, we see an emphasis on different ideas than those expressed in portable art. Although some female figures were drawn within these caves, the vast majority of representational art depicted bison, horse, mammoth, deer, and wild goat. On the other hand, most of the portable art made in this region were Venus figurines, where in the east, sculptures depicted women 
or dangerous animals. The most threatening animals of the Ice Age largely disappeared from cave art during the Gravedian. Artists rarely engraved or painted lions, bears, or rhinoceros, suggesting a decline in the importance of those animals either in real life or in the mythologies of Western Europe. As the decoration of caves grew in popularity during the Middle Gravedian, a distinct set of artistic motifs and a strict artistic convention emerged. Animals were illustrated with simple outlines, few anatomical details, and unnatural proportions. Small heads, swollen bellies, and short pointed limbs defined the Gravedian style. Some engravings are so stylized that the species is barely recognizable. These simplified animals were not only imposed on rock walls, but also engraved into small stone and bone amulets found across the region. This style spread as far as Portugal, in an area called the Coa Valley, which was heavily occupied during the Gravedian. Here, people did not etch images into small stones or cave walls, but instead on large boulders in open fields. Animal outlines with small heads and round bellies were drawn by people separated by hundreds of kilometers from central France to southern Iberia. Such a widespread standardization of art was not seen during the Aurignacian, suggesting that in Gravedian society, artistic norms were more strongly enforced. Other motifs characteristic of Gravedian cave art required blowing or spitting paint. In nine Gravedian caves, this technique was used to create groups of red or black dots. Their significance, sadly, is a mystery. In five caves, the paint-blowing method was used to create hand stencils, sometimes in the hundreds and often surrounding engravings of animals. Intriguingly, many of these hands are missing fingers. Experts who have analyzed them believe that people held some of their fingers down when blowing the paint. And they did not always hold down the same fingers, creating what appear to be a variety of hand gestures. These signs must have been communicating something, and might record an ancient form of sign language. Several caves contained vast arrays of Gravedian images. For example, in the Dordogne region of central France, an area of dense human occupation during the Gravedian, the recently discovered Cusack Cave contains 228 images, mostly of animals. Here, people entered with torches, walked hundreds of meters through winding passages, and engraved the crumbly reddish limestone walls. They composed dozens of panels, which include 71 bison, 24 mammoths, 18 horses, and 7 female silhouettes. Most figures are around 1 meter long, but in the grand panel of Cusack, the central figure is a bison that extends 4 meters, head to tail, and was engraved with greater detail than most. Appearing animated, it kicks its legs and extends its tongue. The prominence of bison at Cusack is shared with other Gravedian sites, suggesting that people in this region held this bulky horned creature in high regard. Interestingly, bison were often engraved next to horses, suggesting some association between this pair, perhaps within their mythology. In addition, a common motif seen at Cusack and other caves is called fluting or macaroni and was the result of a person running four fingers through soft clay in meandering twists and turns. One of the most famous works of art from the Gravedian is the spotted horse panel from Pesh Merla Cave. On this wall, two horses painted in black have typical Gravedian small heads and legs and are surrounded by hand stencils. But unlike other horses, they were drawn with dark manes and spots across their whole body. For a long time, it was thought that this spotted design was simply an artistic choice. But a recent analysis of DNA 
extracted from the bones of wild horses that lived in Western Europe during the Upper Paleolithic, shows that some of them had genes for spots that today are found in some domesticated horses. In other words, Gravedians were probably depicting these horses how they saw them in real life. Another element of realism in Gravedian art is seen in engravings of mammoths, which often included wavy lines down the body to show their thick, drooping hair. Thus, in certain cases, ancient artists took care to faithfully represent the natural world, even if they might have been expressing spiritual ideas at the same time. Interestingly, around 31,000 years ago, Gravedian people entered Chauvet and walked its halls of Oregonation masterpieces. They left charcoal and torch marks that had been dated. The sight of the 5,000-year-old black drawings must have left these visitors awestruck. Whether or not they added any of their own art in this cave is unclear. However, it seems like Gravedians did inherit some artistic formulas from their Oregonation forebears. Distinctive ways of drawing certain animals was repeated in Oregonation and Gravedian art. These include mammoth undersides depicted in an unnatural, concave manner, bison horns seen from a frontal perspective, and horse mouths shaped like a duck bill. At Chauvet, duck-billed horses were drawn. These characteristics pop up occasionally in Oregonation, Gravedian, and even subsequent Solutrian art. It's inconceivable that the recurrence of such specific styles was a coincidence and suggests that people often imitated older illustrations. Although none of the Gvedian art matches the realism and compositional complexity of the charcoal paintings of Chauvet, the number of decorated caves with hundreds of Gvedian drawings indicates that these were important sites within this culture. Most of this art was made far away from evidence of mundane domestic life. Deep within caves, people returned, generation after generation, to a dark, haunting setting illuminated by torchlight to bring animals to life. Engraving animals on cave walls was an important practice for people in southwestern Europe, but only three Gravedian customs that we know about link the whole continent. Two of these we've already talked about, napping backed bladelets and sculpting Venus figurines. The third widespread tradition that differentiates this period from the preceding Oregonation is the burial of their dead. Across Europe during the Gravedian, the deceased were sometimes laid to rest in graves along with valuable objects. Only one human burial has been discovered that dates to the Oregonation, and it comes from the very end of that period, whereas more than 30 intentionally buried Gravedians have been found. We don't know what Gravedian people did with the bodies of their loved ones, but it seems that burial was not part of their culture. They may have practiced other mortuary rituals for which we have not found evidence. For the sake of hygiene, they could have simply deposited the bodies away from camp. The Gravedian burial custom appeared as the number of people in Europe was increasing and as foragers were spending longer portions of the year at single camps, as seen in Pavlovian settlements. These trends may have led to a greater identification of groups with defined territories, prompting them to inter their loved ones in locations they viewed as their home. Most graves are found close to or within their camps, or in frequently visited caves. Burials were especially common in regions with many Gravedian camps, such as Moravia, southern France, and northwestern Italy, suggesting that a high population density may have encouraged this practice. Descriptions of these graves provide us with insights into Gravedian funerals and social organization. Adults and children of all ages were buried. Often, red ochre powder was poured over the body after being placed in the grave, sometimes specifically focused on the head. Most people were buried with physical objects, 
but there's a wide range in the richness of Gravettian graves. The most common grave goods were ornaments, probably worn by those individuals in life, but stone tools, spears, and figurines have also been found. Interestingly, one of the few Gravettian figurines depicting a man was buried alongside a 50-year-old Pavlovian man. His grave also included 600 shell beads and 12 polished stone discs. Some Pavlovian graves were covered by mammoth bones and stone slabs. Again, men and women were buried in similar numbers and with similar quantities of grave goods, reinforcing the idea of relative gender equality in this society. Gravettian graves with ornaments provide some of the earliest insights into how jewelry was worn. Some were clearly necklaces placed on the deceased's chest. In other cases, ivory beads and shells appear to have been part of elaborate headdresses. This seems to corroborate the cross-hatched designs on the heads of Venus figurines. One especially rich Gravettian burial was discovered at Arene Candide in northern Italy, where a teenage male was buried with hundreds of shells, deer canines, ivory pendants, engraved rods of antler, and a large stone blade in his right hand. This individual has been nicknamed the Young Prince. Also in northern Italy, a 37-year-old woman was buried laying on her side with her knees bent, wearing a cap decorated with hundreds of shells and deer teeth, covered in red ochre, and accompanied by a pointed bone tool. Finally, perhaps the most spectacular of all Gravettian burials was discovered at Sungir, Russia. This was a double burial of a 12-year-old boy and 10-year-old girl along with thousands of ivory beads, red ochre, hundreds of fox teeth, animal figurines, and ivory spears. The lack of disturbance suggests that they were buried at the same time. The study of Gravettian burials has led to the idea that a social hierarchy had emerged, in which certain people possessed greater status than others. Some graves contained a few simple objects, whereas others had diverse assortments of possessions, including hundreds of beads. Gravettians buried with many symbolic objects, but without weapons or tools, have been interpreted as shamans, who hold an important role as spiritual leaders. Notably, elaborate child burials indicate that some families enjoyed a privileged status, since such young individuals were unlikely to have earned the level of prestige revealed in their grave goods. Social distinctions in Gravettian society may be related to the appearance of semi-sedentism. It's well established that fully sedentary hunter-gatherers tend to develop strong social hierarchies, as a small number of tribal chiefs gain control over concentrated food resources. It would be an exaggeration to say that Gravettian society was close to full sedentism, or a strict class division. But it's interesting that some degree of these two phenomena coincided around 30,000 years ago. A unique mortuary ritual was followed in southern France, where bodies of the deceased were deposited inside caves above ground, instead of buried. One famous example of this was discovered in the mid-1800s at the Cro-Magnon Rock Shelter. At the time, this skeleton was recognized as a member of our species, who lived in the deep past, and contributed to the understanding that human history in Europe extended back many thousands of years. The term Cro-Magnon has come to be used as a general term for Upper Paleolithic humans. Some of the caves where bodies were deposited were the same ones that contained large amounts of wall art reinforcing the symbolic significance of caves as sanctuaries for the Gravettians of southern France. Along with burying bodies underground and depositing them in caves, Gravettian graves reveal some macabre rituals. Many of these skeletons are missing body parts, including the skull, arms, and legs. It's believed that this pattern was the result of a practice called secondary burial, in which after the body has decomposed, 
people return to the original grave and remove some of the bones to be kept or buried in other locations. As we will see in future episodes, secondary burial is surprisingly common throughout prehistory and may have been a way for nomadic people to keep a piece of their ancestors with them. Even more grisly is the discovery of cut marks on the bones of six individuals buried in France that was consistent with scalping and the removal of the hands. The presence of red ochre suggests to archaeologists who study these bones that this dismembering was part of a mortuary ceremony and not cannibalism. Finally, at one Pavlovian settlement, people removed the teeth of the deceased and converted them into beads by drilling holes through them. Human tooth ornaments were also found at one French Oregonation site. These customs may seem gross to our modern sensibilities or even disrespectful to the dead, but the frequency of these types of practices suggests that they were a way of honoring those who had passed away. To end today's episode, we will move away from the symbolic aspects of life to focus on the final phase of this period, the late Gravedian, that lasts from 29,000 to 25,000 years ago. Just before the late Gravedian began, global ocean levels dropped by an astonishing 40 meters over 2,000 years, indicating that the planet was growing colder and more water was being trapped in glaciers. This was the most significant drop in sea levels in 80,000 years, and the most severe deterioration in environmental conditions since Homo sapiens had arrived in Europe. Unfortunately, this would not be a short-lived cold phase. Instead, it lasted for 10,000 years. The dropping sea level marked the beginning of what geologists refer to as the last glacial maximum, the peak of the most recent ice age. We will talk more about the environmental impacts of this cooling next episode, but starting 30,000 years ago, the conditions for human life in Europe worsened. The beginning of the last glacial maximum had a major effect on Gravedian culture. Shifts in stone tool types occurred all across the continent. Around 29,000 years ago, Pavlovian settlements disintegrated, and the peak of artistic production in Western Europe ended. Northwest Europe was entirely abandoned, from Britain to southern Germany. No late Gravedian camps had been discovered in Swabia, once a cultural hotspot. The absence of people along the upper Danube River severed a major corridor of communication between Eastern and Western Europe, which had been critical for the spread of Gravedian people and ideas. A breakdown in trading networks is seen in the decline of high-quality stone found far away from its source. Based on the number of archaeological sites, the human population of Europe declined by 60% from the middle to late Gravedian. This was a catastrophic time, during which many people probably starved in lands that failed to provide food. What follows this decline is still considered to be part of the Gravedian, because most people in Europe continued to make backed bladelets. But as Arctic conditions encompassed more of northern Europe, the survivors had to adapt. Some groups embraced a simpler life. Crafts that had flourished during the golden age of the Middle Gravedian became less common. Less rigorous standards were applied to the making of stone tools. However, the trend towards cultural simplification was not universal. Simultaneous with the dire situation in Western Europe, human groups thrived in the flatlands east of the Carpathian Mountains. In Romania, Ukraine, and Western Russia, there is actually an increase in the human population during the late Gravedian, possibly due to the migration of refugees from other regions. These people made camps along the major rivers running through the open steppe, such as the Niestet and Don. Among these groups, a fascinating new variant of the Gravedian emerged, 
which archaeologists refer to as the Kostenki of Devo culture. These people survived severe winters by hunting reindeer, horse, bison, and perhaps mammoth, with extremely long ivory points. They made specialized cold-weather clothing using bone needles. The importance of these tiny tools in this culture is revealed in small bone cases believed to be designed to hold and protect needles. Several obvious links existed between the Kostenki of Devo and Central Europe. This cultural similarity is best demonstrated by the spread of a type of stone tool called a shouldered point during the late Gravedian. Rather large, more than 10 centimeters long, stone knappers used the backing technique to create a so-called shoulder on these points. This looks as though a rounded piece was removed from one side of the base. Presumably, this shoulder was associated with a new method in which toolmakers attached the stone point to a handle. Shoulder points were components of knives and hunting weapons. They were made by people from Moravia in the west to the Don River in the east. These tools did not appear in western or southern Europe, revealing a growing cultural divide within the continent. The Kostenki of Devoans of Eastern Europe lived in many ways like Pavlovians, whose culture had already collapsed more than 1,000 kilometers to the west. For example, they often established settlements near large deposits of mammoth bones and built houses with them. Their dwellings were generally circular and partly sunken into the ground. They dug storage pits with shovels and picks made from mammoth bones and tusks. The structures at these camps suggest that they were occupied for several months at a time. Some of the larger Kostenki of Devon settlements were organized according to a standard layout, with a line of ten hearths built in the middle of a centralized camp area, about 30 meters long and seemingly designed to accommodate dozens of people. On the periphery of this shared space, circular houses and storage pits were placed. Kostenki of Devon settlements that have been found are full of cultural debris, including food remains, stone tools, an impressive array of bone tools, and diverse symbolic objects. They produced many small sculptures, both of women and animals, from stone and ivory. In fact, the largest known collection of Venus figurines dating to the Gravedian comes from Eastern Europe. Strong cultural norms are evident in the consistently broad hips and protruding bellies of the Venuses, which were the most uniformly shaped in Europe. Besides figurines, Kostenki of Devoans are distinguished for the degree to which they decorated their bone and ivory tools in both geometric designs and animal-like shapes. These engravings covered their shovels, picks, awls, smoothers, and needle cases, and repeated motifs include zigzagging lines, herringbone patterns, and triangular notches. The handles of their bone tools were sometimes carved to resemble animals, including owl-like creatures. They made similar ivory diadems and bracelets as the Pavlovians had, and engraved them with their own distinctive designs. The similarity to the Pavlovian culture, and the strong connection between Central and Eastern Europe during the late Gravedian, has led to the theory that a migration of Pavlovians eastward from Moravia contributed to the emergence of this culture. Support for this hypothesis comes from the appearance of Carpathian obsidian in the eastern steppes, about 700 kilometers from its source, suggesting a long-distance east-west movement of people. Ultimately, the Kostenki of Devo represents an evolution of Gravedian culture, maintaining many of its more complex elements, including structured settlements and a rich artistic tradition. This transformation is the last of many that we have seen in our study of the first 17,000 years of the Upper Paleolithic. The Aurignacian and Gravedian reveal that even deep in our species past, human cultures continually reshaped themselves into unique expressions. The Gravedian period of European prehistory 
would come to an end between 26,000 and 25,000 years ago. The world would continue to get colder, and as people clung to survival, new forager customs would arise. The peak of the last ice age was about to permanently alter the cultural landscape of the continent. In our next episode, we will explore the new cultures that emerged during the worst of the last glacial maximum. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Your support will allow me to continue bringing you our prehistory.